I will be sharing on God's generals in Africa yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God's generals in Africa yesterday, today, and tomorrow. This was a teaching, a lecture, a teaching I delivered some few years ago during our annual Open Bible Conference in Ubumosho, Nigeria. And I think it is something that I would like to share with the, with the world. It is something that I think we all need to listen to. I will be sharing from the book of Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 31. Act 17, verses 16 to 31. That's where I'm going to be, uh, that's what I'm going to be discussing. And I'll be making references to the work of um, uh, a great African writer, Chinwe Zhu, who also made a lot of references to people, writers like Marcus Garvey, uh, Cheikh Anta Diop, and Ivan Van Satima, I'll be bringing a lot of illustration as I try to uh, explain and illustrate this passage to us and motivate and challenge us uh, about what God wants to do with our continent. Let me start by saying that God is good at arranging opportunities for us to take vantage view of life and have a critical analysis and understanding of some issues. This is what I saw with uh, Apostle Paul in this Act 17. Um, of course, he had to be smuggled out of Thessalonica to Berea. He was later also to Athens for the fear of the Jews. In that uh, Act chapter 17, if you look at it from verses 1 to 15, he was to wait for Silas and Timothy to join him at Athens. But while he was doing this, his inquisitive spirit caught something. In verse 16 of that act, chapter 17, the scripture says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols while he was waiting for them. God created an opportunity and his spirit also tuned and keyed into it. While he was waiting, he, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And in verse 17, the scripture says, So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Paul got a good opportunity to see something that looks perplexing to him, and he will not go without addressing it. Um, I love the way New King James Version rendered uh, uh, that word greatly, dis uh, greatly distressed. He was not just greatly distressed, he was provoked. That was the word New King James Version used. He was provoked when he saw the situation of Athens. The Greek word used in that place actually means to stimulate, to provoke, to rot, and to irritate. To stimulate, to provoke, to rot to irritate. So what got him to this level of emotional and um, spiritual agitation? He saw a people who had great potentials because God has so blessed them with great men. Anytime we talk about the Greeks, we remember them for philosophy and many other things. Philosophy, they were philosophers with all kinds of knowledge. But unfortunately, their knowledge drove a wedge between them and God instead of helping them to fulfill their destiny. So he had to address them. Men of Athens. Men of Athens. He had to address them. These were uh, men of today. The today of that time. And they were the progenitors of tomorrow of these people. The men of yesterday left a legacy of idolatry for them. And Paul wondered if this is what they would leave behind for the coming generation. That was why after he had, he had 
pondered on what happened. And that verse 22, Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, men of Athens. And I will say, people of Athens. Of course, the word men is in generic, in generic term. I see that in every way you are very religious. Men of Athens, people of Athens. You are the men of today. You are the progenitors of tomorrow. There were men yesterday who lived before you. They left a legacy of idolatry. And Paul began to wonder, what are you going to leave for the generation that is coming after you? Now, I'm speaking to men and women of Africa today. I'm speaking to men and women of Africa. The big question God will be asking us is, what did the men of yesterday leave behind for us? What are the men and women of today doing? And what will the generation that is coming, what will they meet on ground? When, what will they inherit from us? That's why I want us to bring some five truths from the passage that we're studying, especially from verses 22 to 31. There are some five truths I want us to, um, I want us to take home. Number one truth is this. Humans are always the custodian of knowledge for any generation. Humans are always the custodian of knowledge for any generation. Verse 22 to 23 says, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walk around and look carefully at your object of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Paul recognized what it meant, what it means to be among these men of Athens, people of Athens. The Greeks have produced real men, real men, real great people. We have examples like Parmenides, Anaxagoras, Anaximander, Empedocles, Zeno, Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, among several others. This philosopher's contribution to knowledge has still been celebrated till today, and their names may just never go into extinction. We still celebrate their work. Their work is still relevant uh, till today. You can't talk about theater, can't talk about poetry, democracy, sport, including the famous Olympic Games. Can't talk about philosophy without the Greeks. This is what this man left behind. In Paul's days, there were still the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers. Those are the people he mentioned in verse 18, that a group of Epicureans and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. These philosophers were still there, even in these days of Paul. Who are the Epicureans? They were influential. They are among the educated upper classes. Their views about God were similar to deism. That is, God is not involved in the universe. God is not involved in the universe. God is irrelevant. If there were any gods at all, they were only those which were known or which are known through sense knowledge, such as the stars and the planet. That's what the Epicureans believe. So they were opposed to pleasure. Uh, uh, excuse me. For them, the goal of life was pleasure, a situation where there are no pains or emotional troubles since God is not involved in their, in their, in their situation. They don't, God is not relevant. But the Stoics were the opposite. They were more popular. They were opposed to pleasure, unlike the... Epicureans, they were pleasure and opposed to pleasure and often criticized the Epicureans. However, the biggest legacy that this man, their philosophies and the culture of their times handed over to upcoming generation was pure idolatry, pure idolatry. After setting up an idol for every god, they created one for a god which they might have missed out of their ignorance. So they set up, after creating god, I mean, a god for uh, after setting up a, an idol for every god, it's okay, let's dedicate one. And we call it to the unknown god. Perhaps there's one god that we missed out. Let's dedicate one. That was why Paul was very, very provoked in his spirit as he pondered on the situation of the city of Athens. Now, there's no generation and nation of people without men and women, as Paul saw in Athens. 
In Africa too, we have had men, men and women, and we would continue to have. In my readings of Chimwezu and some of the great scholars he quoted, I have records chronicling the great achievement of Africans and proving that the black world is a very inventor of what is popularly known as the Western civilization. We've read about the Kemets. The Kemets are the black Egyptian and uh, the black Egyptians, and it is common knowledge that civilization began in Egypt. Several elements of civilization are traced to them. These include plant domestication, as far back as 16,000 BC, the Kemets, the black Egyptians, were domesticating plant, writing, uh, like hieroglyphics, demotic, alphabet, balance and scale, uh, the calendar, both civil and astronomical, the wheel, even Pythagoras' theorem, before Pythagoras is said to have taken it to Greece, coordinates the oldest record of seagoing ship and the oldest map in the world. These were found uh, among the Kemet of the ancient Egypt. Then we have the oldest example of large scale metal sculpture, stone paved road, gunpowder, gilder plane, atomic theory, heliocentricity and gravitation, oldest textbooks on, on anatomy, pulse taking, bone setting techniques, and the oldest book on embalming. They were found among, found among the, the Kemets of, 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 of Egypt. If these are attributed to a particular sort of Africa, let's say, okay, fine, this is in the northern part of Africa. We don't know them, who are they? And that's, Egypt cannot be Africa. Egypt cannot represent all of Africa. Then let's move down to other places around Africa for other records. There are other records of great things that our forebears did. For example, it is observed, it's on record that there were African astronomical observatories, one as far back as 300 BC in Kenya. It is observed and noted that Africans in the Lake Victoria region were making carbon steel 1,500 years ago. Tetracycline was used 1,400 years ago in Nubia. The Bantu were using aspirin centuries ago. A smallpox vaccine was brought to the US by the African slave called Onesimus. And this was reported by his master, Cotton Meta, 1663 to 1728. Africans were performing eye cataract surgery in Mali in the 14th century as reported by the Arabs. Then what is probably the first drug to treat hypertension and psychotic disorder, recipine, was developed by Africans. African navigation was far more sophisticated and assumed. Carthaginian type vessels were found on Niger. Phoenician and Egyptian type vessels were found on the African edge of the Indian Ocean. While high still covered much of Europe, Africans in the flood plains of the Nile were raising crops of wheat, barley, lentils, chickpeas, capers, and dates. It's also discovered that Africans in the Kenya Highlands had domesticated cattle some 15,000 years ago. In the Black Egypt of the Pharaohs, pyramid building architects were using coordinates to draw a curve some 5,000 years ago. Descartes introduced the use of coordinate to European science only in the 17th century. These are some things we found in the record about what Africans have done in time past. And this was perhaps the reason why somebody like Matthew Ashimalu asked a big question. He wrote a book, What is Wrong with Being Black? And that's a book I recommend to every one of us. The title is What is Wrong with Being Black? If we read that book, we'll be challenged be provoked. He asks some questions. He said, what is wrong with a people who built the first civilization in the first 3,000 to 4,000 years of humanity? What is wrong with the wealthiest continent in the world, but also with the poorest people in the world? He asked, he, he suggested like many others who have studied the situation with Africa, that perhaps idolatry was one of our biggest problems. And we need to think about it. That's one of the biggest problems of the Greeks too. 
idolatry. Paul wondered how a God who, who made the heaven and earth and everything in it and confirmed by this same Greek through their own poets would not look like an object like gold or silver or stone or something made by man's design and skill. That's his question in verse 29. He said, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design. He said, if we are his offspring, then we must look like him. And he must look like us, though his higher is a supreme, uh, supreme spirit being. I, I, idolatry is terrible. Idolatry demeans, it demeans us. It makes human beings look foolish, however intelligent we may be. It makes us to mock God by misrepresenting his being. And it makes us attribute the nature uh, and work of God to the material things he has created. It's, it's a demonstration of complete, complete ignorance when we go into idolatry. That verse 30 of that. Act 17, he, say, he says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, such ignorance. So to, to begin to you know, compare God with idols, to set up idols for God is complete ignorance, complete, complete ignorance. And it is not something we should continue to engage in. But the first truth is that you must know that every nation and men, or every nation, have men and women who have contributed, who would, who could contribute greatly to his knowledge and the product of knowledge like the Greek philosophers did in our passage. So that's the first truth. Humans are always the custodian of knowledge for any generation. The second truth I want to bring out of that passage is that every human being took their roots from the blood of Adam. Every human being took their roots from the blood of Adam. Adam, look at verse 26, Act 17, verse 26. It says, from one man, he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole heart, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. The boundaries of their land. From one man, he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole heart. So, the truth, so every human being took their root from the blood of Adam. Whether Greek Jews, Americans, Europeans, Asians, or the Aborigines, the Caucasians, Hispanics, Arabs, Africans, white, black, whatever. All human beings on earth came from one man made in the image of God. And that man is called Adam. Africans did not descend from hips. No. Africa is not a cost race. No. Africans have been brutalized, bastardized as animals, as substandard human, uh, human race. Africans' resources have been exploited and pillaged for centuries. Its people have been enslaved again and again. It is believed that colonization was what liberated them from darkness. <laughs> and look at some examples that were cited by, by Chin Weizu in some of his writings, uh, some extracts that he got about people's perception of Africa. Somebody said, the Negro nation are, as a rule, submissive to slavery because Negroes have little that is essentially human and have attributes that are quite similar to those of dumb animals. An Arab writer, historian, philosopher, and sociologist said that, Ibn Khaldun, 14th century. The same man said, we know that the Zanj, the Blacks, are the least intelligent and the least discerning of of mankind and the least capable of understanding the consequences of actions. Another person was quoted, Joseph Conrad. He was quoted as saying that Africa is no historical part of the world. That is, uh, that is not that, that is the, it, it is not in history, and is the heart of darkness. <laughs> Another writer said, "Pre-colonial African life was a blank, uninteresting, brutal barbarism." Professor Egerton of Oxford. Somebody said the thinking of black is prelogical. Levy Brew, 1910. Said the, pre the thinking of blacks is prelogical. Another writer said the Negro is a child. The Negro is a child. And with children, nothing can be done without the use of authority. With regard to Negroes, then I have coined the formula I am your brother. It is true, but your elder brother. <laughs> Another writer said, Africans do men are falling men. 
Another writer said, all scientific investigations of the subject prove the Negro to be an hip. Another writer said, slavery has elevated the Negro from savagery. Another writer said, I mean, the root, I am apt to suspect the Negroes to be naturally inferior to the whites. There never was a civilized nation of any other complexion than white, nor even an individual, eminent either in action or speculation. Not to mention our colonies, there are Negro slaves dispersed all over Europe, uh, of which none ever discovered any symptom of ingenuity. In Jamaica, indeed, they talk of one Negro as a man of parts and learning, but is likely is admired for very slender accomplishments, like a parrot who speaks a few words plainly. I think somebody summarized it this way. Jaime Cicer, the famous negative poet, he sarcastically wrote, hooray for those who have never invented anything, that's Africans. Those who never explored anything. Those who never tamed anything. Those who give themselves up to the essence of things. Hooray to them. Sarcastically, he wrote that. Now, the truth is this, there is never Whatever we have, I've just read, this is never a representative of whom God has made man. Any man, any human being, top class of Africans to be. Every human being made in the image of God is an intelligent being created like Adam to be fruitful, to multiply, replenish the heart, subdue it, have dominion over all that God had made. The result of the fall cannot be doubted, yes, it can be denied but it does not alter the genesis of humanity. Right from the scripture till the world will end, the only limitation a man, a woman, a nation, or a people can have is the limitation they impose on themselves, not the limitation that God is imposing on them. So, every human being took their roots from the blood of Adam. So there's no need for discrimination, there's no need for segregation, there's no need for any inferiority or superiority complex. It's just not necessary. We all came from the blood of Adam. Number three thing I want to bring out from this passage is that our times and boundaries are deliberately established by God. Our times and boundaries are deliberately established by God. Look at verse 26, verse 26, that same verse 26. It says, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and they marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. That's, that's significant. New King James Version says, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. This NIV says, he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. God placed every man where they belong. And he was very deliberate about it. Yes, there was a time human beings were dispersed at the Tower of Babel as a result of rebellion. That's in Genesis chapter 11. Interestingly, it was all human beings that were there, not Africans. Then. It had nothing to do with race. It had nothing to do with color. It had nothing to do with, to do with any people. What each person did with where they found themselves after the dispersion. I think is what matters. Africa as a continent was not an accident. Whatever your nation, whatever your tribe, whatever your culture, language, color, or shape, they are never by accident. While it is true that some environment limits or gives you more opportunity than the other, the glory and genius of God in us have no limit. That's why Psalm, Psalm 8 verse 3, Psalm 8 verse 3 to 8 says, you see, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the star, which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the hair and the fish of the sea, all that swim the part of the sea. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. In all the earth. In other words, the majesty of God is often demonstrated when man, in his generic form, men and women, occupy their responsible position in the structure of creation and exhibit uh, their 
crown of glory and honor which God himself has bestowed on him. God has bestowed. That passage says, you made him a little lower, little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hand. So each time we, we, we demonstrate, we exhibit that crown of glory and honor, then we are, we are showing that we have rightly occupied our responsible position in the structure of creation. It would have been the greatest joy, it would have been the greatest joy of God to see us in our geographical boundaries, within our cultures, doing great with what God has deposited in us. But our fallen humanity would always make us oppress each other and limit us unnecessarily. John, John C. Maxwell you know, once observed that there are some species of fish that will grow according to the size of their environment. If you put them in a tiny aquarium, they will be small, even when they are adults, because they are limited by the space of that aquarium, they remain small in that aquarium. But if you release them to a, into a huge natural body of water, then you see them grow to their intended size. It's the same with people. If they live in a harsh and limited environment, um, they stay small and limited. But when you put them somewhere else that encourages their growth, you will see that they will expand and reach their potential. I want to say that nothing is wrong with the people in themselves. But when the environment is managed in a 